and amen. You may be seated. Thank you guys for leading us. Amen. God's good. I read in the bulletin, I said, uh, I seen something about a roast and I got all excited and then I realized I was the one getting roasted. <laughs> that kind of changed it up a little bit, right? It's amazing how just a word or two can make a difference, right? I don't possibly have any idea what they would make fun of me for, but I'm sure they'll get creative and find some ways. Amen. God's so good. We had a great day yesterday. We got to go down to the valley and go apple picking. And uh, let me tell you, that's a feat when you have four kids. Because you go in with about 80 pounds of kids, 90 pounds of kids, and you come out with about 100 pounds of kids and apples and everything else. But we did it, and uh, we had uh, my mom kind of step in and give us a hand chasing kids around, and it was great. Great to celebrate this time of the year. I love this time of the year. We start looking towards Christmas and, and all the amazing blessings that Christmas time is, and, uh, and we've recovered from a good, busy summer. A lot of good stuff going on in the church. I just want to say, I, I, I don't think Pastor Carmen mentioned, I don't know if he even knew, but there was a real good opportunity somebody had at the clothing exchange to share the love of Christ and, and to pray with somebody and spend some time talking to somebody. And that's one of those things that that's not an environment that that would normally be in. You know, you're just going, coming to get clothing, but we believe when we give a cup of water in the name of Jesus, that we can honor him and then that, that directs people back. And I think that that's just absolutely fantastic. That's just a small Small sample of what God could do whenever we commit our lives to him. And uh, so I'm encouraged by that, and I think that it's absolutely fantastic. How many people were here last week? Give me a thumbs up if you are here last week. All right, Pastor Carmen spoke from Ezekiel 16, verse 49 to 50, and he spoke on uh, the sins and, uh, and Sodom. And, and I'm just going to read through that really quickly. It says, Now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, Overfed, unconcerned, and did not help the poor and the needy. They were haughty and did detestable things before me. Therefore, I did away with them as you've seen. They were proud, overfed, wealthy, underworked, lazy, and they didn't help the poor and the needy. And this is the world we live in, and we're very much fighting battle, these battles in our own lives if we're honest with ourselves. That same spirit kind of creeps up and wants us to, to make all of this, everything we live, about us. We want comfort, we want security, we want all of that, and... Uh, Pastor Carmen challenged us last week. It was kind of funny because when he called the worship team up, I don't know, sometimes a word is, is, a, is a hard word, but it needs to be said. And it was, it was hard for the worship team to follow up. What do you do when somebody's challenged? My heart was challenged. My heart was challenged. I actually felt guilty about the things in my life that I didn't put God first and foremost in. And uh, I hope, hopefully for the rest of you guys that were here, you felt the same and it was something you can reflect on during the week and uh, kind of come back to. I want to look and continue down this thread, this chain of thought, and uh, I'm going to be looking at a different city, actually, and a different, um, a different situation, but some very similar truths that we see. We live in a great country. Amen? We live in the world's best country, in my opinion, and we live on, on the, the east coast of the world's best country and the best coast, right, of the best country. We live in the best coast of the best country in the world. How about that? except for January to March. <laughs> then Florida sounds even better. But, um, but this is just fantastic. We live in a great country, but there's a lot of things about our country that aren't so great. If you hang with me, I know statistics sometimes can be overloading, but if you hang with me for just a few minutes, I want to look at some of the statistics of our society and our culture, the world's greatest culture, greatest, greatest country in the world, in my opinion. Best hockey, too. Our country, there's some statistics, divorce. Average marriage in our country lasts 14 and a half years. That's just long enough to have kids and break up a family. Tell me that isn't the enemy, just. Tell me that's not a battleground. Canada, 48% of marriages end in divorce, which is a little lower than the US at 53 and a lot lower than Belgium at 71% of marriages end in divorce. Our world is hurting. Common reasons, number one, I fell out of love. Because love, apparently, is an emotion, not a choice. Fell out of love. Number two, poor communication. Then infidelity, finances, and financial stress, emotional and physical abuse. What they don't say is that each one of these are affected by selfishness and pride, the same sins that were common in Sodom. They can be attributed to all of this. 
when I put my desires ahead of my wife's desires, things start to unravel in a hurry. This is the culture of the world we live in. And it affects people. 22% of children that live in a single-parent home where the mother is the parent is considered by Canadian standards to be in poverty. The effect on children, odds are 11 times more likely that a child of divorce will fall into poverty in their own lives. 11 times. And two to three times more likely to drop out of school and two times more likely to suffer with anxiety and depression. It affects our children. You know what? We need a solution. We need Jesus. Violence. Half of all women in Canada have experienced at least one incident of physical or sexual abuse by the age of 16. Half. Half. On any given night in Canada, the average of 3,491 women and 2,724 children sleep in shelters because it isn't safe at home on any given night. And the crazy thing is about 300 of those are turned away because there's no room available. The men who are called to provide and protect, this world is corrupted through sin and selfishness and, and stress and all of that. We need a solution. We need Jesus. Looking at sexual activity, 25% of teens will have engage in sex before the age of 16, 50% before the age of 18, and 80% before they turn 20. That's average of eight years before anybody gets married. Something created to be experienced between a husband and wife is corrupted by this world, tainted and corrupted by sin. We need a solution. We need Jesus. Abortion. 2010, 64,641 abortions were in Canada. In 2010, 60% of our country agrees with abortion under absolutely any circumstance. And the media goes crazy when some hunter shoots a lion that's terrorizing a village. Or they have to shoot a gorilla that's, that's threatening the life of a child. It's hashtag this and hashtag that. Hashtag save Cecil the lion. Hashtag Harambe. Whatever the gorilla's name was. And those are the things that are important. And and that's the life that people care about. This is the world we live in. We need a solution. We need Jesus. In 2009, there was 3,890 suicides in Canada. That's a rate of 11.5 per 100,000 people. Suicide rate is, is surprisingly higher between the ages of 40 to 59, which is also the highest divorce rate for people. Married people actually have a lower suicide rate than those who are single, maybe because they want to kill their spouse instead of themselves, I don't know. (laughs) Lower suicide. Suicide is one of the leading causes of death for all people, but those among ages 18 to 34, suicide was the second leading cause of death only to accidents. In 2009, 202 individuals aged 15 to 19 in Canada committed suicide represented a quarter, 23% of all deaths in that age group. That's up from 9% in 1974. So things aren't getting better. Things are getting worse. And we need a solution, people. We need Jesus. People need Jesus. Pastor Carmen said this statement. He said, your priorities, was from Oswald Chambers, your priorities must be God first, God second, and God third until your life is continually face-to-face with God and no one else is taken into account whatsoever. Eyes only for Jesus. So the reality is this world is messed up. There's statistic upon statistic and stuff that, that's just crazy, but what do we do about it? That's what I want to talk today. How do we engage the culture we live in? We're stuck in this world, and God's called us to actually be in this world, right? But how do we engage it? How do we connect? How do we talk to people? Do we retreat? I know if we just buy a big piece of land, put up a giant fence, maybe wear some old-fashioned clothes, then you know what? Maybe then we can finally get our hearts right with God and the world will be okay. Is that what God's called us to do? We don't retreat. We don't hide. Do we get aggressive? I know. What we'll do is we'll make some big giant signs about how much God hates everybody and we'll put those out in front of the church. That'll draw people to Jesus. No. Do we run away? Do we hide? How about do we shelter our kids and protect them? Do we homeschool them so they don't get affected by the sin in this world? Do we live our lives in fear? If not, how do we fight? What do we do? How do we engage the culture we live in? How do we engage this culture? I want to look at a story from the Word of God this morning and um, 
It's a story that just constantly speaks to me on different angles, and I want to share it with you guys this morning. It's a very common one, looking at the story of Jonah. He's called to face a culture, to come face to face with a culture that was bent against him and his beliefs and everything that he stood for. If you're following along, it's in Jonah 1. I'm going to read through this section of scripture pretty quickly. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, said, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because the wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord. He headed to Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard, sailed and fled from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid and each cried out to his own God and they threw the cargo in the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us, so that we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots and find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lots fell on Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us, who is responsible for making this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I'm a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them, and they asked, What have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord, because he already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, What should we do to make the sea calm down for us? He said, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. It will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not. The sea grew even wilder than before. They cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, don't let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, Lord, have, have done it, for you, Lord, have done as you pleased. And then they took Jonah and threw him in overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Jonah's prayer was, now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. He was in the fish for three days and three nights, and he prayed. In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From the deep in the realm of the dead, I call for help, and you listen to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the sea, and the currents swirled about me, and your waves and breakers swept over me. I said I've been banished from your sight, Yet I look again towards your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me, the deep surrounded me, seaweed wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank, and the earth beneath uh, barred me in forever. But you, my Lord my God, brought me up from the pit. My life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord. And my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I will shout... I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. I will say, salvation has come from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish and had vomited Jonah onto dry land. Then the word came to Jonah a second time, go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim it, the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began going a day's journey into the city and proclaiming 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let him give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows, God may yet relent with his compassion and turn his fierce anger so we will not perish. When God had seen how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring upon them the destruction that he had threatened. A couple key concepts from the scripture I want to look at and I want to give you guys... Three points. So if you're taking notes, um, typical sermon, you have three points to take. Key concept. First off, this message that we have and this message that Jonah had was not his message. It's not my message. It's God's message. Twice it said the word of the Lord came to Jonah and the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time to go to the great city of Nineveh. That tells me that Jonah was a messenger. You know what that tells me about us? We too are messengers. God's put a word on us to carry. It's not our job. It's not our job to water this down. It's not our job to manipulate it just because we think it won't be received, just because we think it's too direct, too judgmental, too harsh. 
It's not our job to water down the word of God so that people can receive it better. It's our job to relay the message of the king. Right? So it's not our job to change the word. It's God's word. We're just the messengers. It's a letter sealed from the king with, with, with a, sealed, a seal put on it. As soon as we break that seal and we start changing what God's called for us to share to people, it loses its power and loses its authority. Second key to this, the wind and the sea and the ocean and the storm is a result of Jonah's disobedience. He wouldn't even have been in that area. He wouldn't even have been near any of that stuff if he was obedient to God. So we avoid trying to get messy with this call God's put on our lives, trying to find an easy way out, we end up in a mess. So I know this is my fault, this great storm has come upon you. Third key is that we can't sleep through our call. God's trying to wake up Jonah. He's shaking the sea and Jonah's down, down in the basement trying to, trying to sleep through it and trying to hide from it. You can't hide from it. God will shake the foundations of the earth to get our attention. We can't sleep through the call he put on us as a church. Even when we take small steps in the right direction, we can see lives changed. This is interesting. In this, in this passage, it says, they took Jonah and threw him overboard and the raging sea grew calm. Jonah just following through with what, what he felt God calling him to do. At this time, the men greatly feared the Lord and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Jonah's small step of obedience even though he was way off track, led a whole boat full of people to Jesus, to the Lord. We're called to do the same thing. doesn't matter where you're at today. If you've fought and you've run and you've spent 20 years running from what God's called you to do, first step you take in the right direction, lives will start to be impacted. Fifth key, the only option to take, the only option is to take the word of the Lord to the people who need it. That's the only option we have. When God saw that they, did, they, that they turned from their evil ways, he relented and didn't bring destruction upon them that he had threatened. So how do we engage this world? I think it has to do with how we see three things. So if you're taking notes, this is it. Okay, the first one, big number one. How do we see this world? I'll tell you one thing, this world is not our enemy. And we could treat it like that because it's, it's so different than us. It opposes everything that we believe. The world is not our enemy. Sinners are not our enemy because guess what? Every one of us, maybe that's why there's so much fighting in the church, right? (laughs) Because we're all a bunch of sinners that God's redeemed and changed. The world is not our enemy. In fact, the world, God loves the world. He loves the world. And we know that scripture that he sent his son. He loves the world so much Matthew 9, verse 36 says, When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like a sheep without a shepherd. When people are vocal standing against Christianity and aggressive against Christianity, you gotta not see it as somebody trying to pick a fight with you. You gotta see it as somebody who doesn't know any better. They're lost. They need Jesus. They're hurting. Their heart hurts. That's why they act that way. Their heart is in pain. There's something missing. They can't find anything to bring them happiness. And they see us with happiness and they resent it. We need to see them as lost people. We recently just got the opportunity to go on vacation because of great, phenomenal, absolutely fantastic um, parents. My mom watched too and Tanya's parents watched too. They divide and conquer and we got to go on a vacation. We're walking around Disney and we're standing outside one of the lines and that's what you do, you just pay to wait in a line there. That's pretty much the whole, the whole thing. And there was a young boy, probably about Gabe's age, probably about five years old, that was lost. He was crying, and there was a Disney worker standing with him, asking, you know, what's your mother's name? What was she wearing? Trying to find, in this crowd of people, trying to find the mother. And my heart broke, like, this kid is fine, he's with one of the workers, but I felt compelled to stand there until he found his mother. Right? I just felt... My heart went out to him. Why? Because he was lost. He was helpless. He was crying out for his mother. He was crying out to, to have the thing that was missing from his life. And, and he, was, he was afraid. And he was lost. And he was emotional. And my heart went out to him because I just seen, well, I would hate to have that happen to my son. But you know what? We need to see the world like that lost little boy that is crying out and trying to find any way it can 
to find happiness and safety and security and all of that. And this, this young boy lost and crying and tears rolling down his face. I didn't look at that young boy and be like, wow, that kid's ruining my trip. My goodness, I'm standing here in line and this kid's crying. Ruining my vacation, imagine. What a ridiculous kid. What a crazy mother lost his, her kid. I'm sure she was crying just as much, freaking out. I didn't look at him like that. I looked at him and said, this kid, this poor child is lost. And I felt compelled to do something about it. I felt compelled. I wanted to grab him and pick him up and be like, whose kid is this? Whose kid is this? And then I would have probably got arrested, but I felt compelled to do something, to do something. And this is the way the Heavenly Father sees this world as a lost bunch of kids that he feels compelled to do something about it. He feels compelled to have them come back into the fold. He feels compelled because they're separated from him. And you know what he says? Well, I know how to do this. I'm going to send my church to reach them. I'm going to send my church to go after these lost kids that are in pain and suffering. I'm going to send my church to do that. The bridegroom of Christ to do that. And I'm going to send them with this message that there is a father who loves them and it wants to draw near to them. We can engage culture when we see our world not as an enemy, but as a lost child in need of a heavenly father. It's our calling. It's our job to direct the lost world to this heavenly father. The message, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall have eternal life. God loves the world. That's a theology. That's who God is. It says something about him. He's a loving God. There's actually some Christology in there too. It talks about Jesus, the son, that he sent his son to die for our sins. But there's a part of this that we kind of overlook. We want to tell people that God loves them and that his son died. The part that says whoever believes in him, that concept, the message that we're carrying to people, we think, well, it's just a message of love. It's a message of acceptance. It's a message of, of this parent. Well, whoever believes in him, that's a loaded little three-word uh, part of that scripture because belief in Jesus means you believe who he says he is. So the message you're taking is that God loves you. He sent his son to die for you. You need to believe in him. You need to believe who he says he is. You need to believe in how he says to be saved. That we need to repent from sin. That we need to turn from our wicked ways. That we need to come to God. We can't have salvation without repentance. We can't have salvation without the sin in our lives being cleaned out. He says that he's the only way. He's the only way. So we go out with this message and you know what, unless we include God loves us, he sent his son to die for us, and he wants to fix things in your life, he wants to change things in your life, he wants to clear the sin out of your life, unless we're willing to take that part of the equation, there's a big piece of that scripture that's missing. Unless we're saying, you know what, you need to believe in Jesus, you need to have your life transformed by Jesus, you need to surrender to Jesus. If we miss that, we're opening that letter from the king and we're removing a big part of that. You guys follow me today? We're removing a big part of that message that God is love and he sent his son. And the part that we always skip over is you need to get your life straightened out. You need to surrender to him. You need to allow your heart to change. You need to allow him to change who you are and who you think you are. There's a big part of that's missing. The message it just isn't God is love, but that a price was paid for us. And we need to take that, accept it, believe it, and repent. Because he is the only way that whoever believes in him shall have eternal life, that eternal life is given for those who believe in God and who he says he is. How we see our world changes everything. We want to engage in culture, we need to see the world as somebody lost and need a shepherd. We need to see it not as our enemy. We need to take the gospel unfiltered, not watered down, not compromised, not altered to meet some needs or change for the audience. We can find creative ways to tell people about the love of Jesus. Don't get me wrong. I will, I will wear a costume and dance out on the street if I think it's gonna bring people to the gospel message of Jesus, if I can open a door to share this message of Christ's love for us. I'll do anything it takes, anything it takes, except jump out of an airplane. That was Pastor Carmen. 
<laughs> I'll do whatever it takes, but I don't want to compromise the gospel and the truth. Like Jonah is called in Nineveh, he initially didn't want, it, didn't want to. He was scared to engage. He was scared to go, but God seen hurt, pain, and the need in Nineveh. They were sheep without a shepherd, and he loved them, and he called him to that place that was scary, to those people that were foreign and, and, and intimidating. And he's called us to do the same thing. And we're naive if we think that we can get by meeting here on Sunday, singing our songs and going out and call ourselves the church. We need to see the world as a lost child and we need to do something about it. It's how we see the world, how do we see ourselves? 2 Corinthians 5, 20 to 21 says, so we are messengers for Christ. They use the term ambassadors. God is using us to call people. So we are standing here for Christ and begging people come back to God. Christ did no wrong thing, but for our sake, God put the blame of our own wrong ways on Christ so that now God sees us as good because we are in Christ. How do we see ourselves? Mark 16, verse 15 says, go into all the world, preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. So go into all the world, preach, take the message. John 14, verse 26 says, be, But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, who the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things or remind you everything I've said to you. You've received a message. So like I said, this message that we're called to bring is not ours. It's not my message. It wasn't Jonah's message. It was the Lord's message. The message we carry has a seal from the throne room of God. But do we believe the message we carry is from God? Do we believe it's actually his word speaking to us? People aren't going to believe you or listen to you if you don't even believe it yourself. I see a lot of times people don't want to tell people what God's word actually says. Now, I've been guilty of this too. There's been times in my life where I'm like, how do you go up to somebody and tell them that, you know, they need to get rid of that sin in their life? That's a tough thing to do. It's a tough thing to do. It's, it's, it's never comfortable it's never comfortable, but it's also not optional. It's never comfortable, but it's also not optional. So how do we see ourselves? The message we call to bring is not ours. We're just messengers. Don't you love that statement, don't shoot the messenger? <laughs> we don't have the authority to change God's word. We don't have that authority to do that. We don't have, it's not optional. Our message is, is, comes from man. God's message is divine. It loses authority when we change it. It's not optional. We can't choose between living out this message and you know, coming to church, singing songs, and going back about our way. We're called to go on a mission. We're called to go on a mission. God's called us on a mission, not on a cruise where we can sit our, put our feet up and relax and go down and below deck and take a nap. God's called us on a mission. He's called us on a mission. He's called me on a mission. So many times I'll, I'll, I fail every time. I fail all the time. Maybe that's what they're going to roast me about. I don't know. But I fail all the time. That, that I, come sh- I come up short all the time. I miss opportunities every day to share people. I, 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 I think I'm on mission and then all of a sudden I realize I'm kind of off mission. I realized that, hey, you know what, maybe I did just kind of take a nap there and miss something. But my my heart today and this morning is not one of condemnation, but one of encouragement that we need to realize that God has called us to go. Engage a culture. It's easy for us to hang around with people that we know. It's, it's easy for us to hang around with people that we know. You know, you don't even need to be in the same the same age demographic to get along with people. Some of my friends in this church, a couple years older than me. Me and Ross always having chicken together. Him having to lie to Maisie about it. (laughs) You know, that's easy. Me and Howard always working on stuff together. It's easy to get along with people that you have these things in common with. You don't even have to be the same age. They're like at least 10 years older than me. <laughs> but it is hard. I'm not lying. It is hard to, for me to go up to another 35-year-old guy and start telling him about Jesus. But it's what I need to do. 
It's what I need to do. I need to start talking to my neighbors more. I need to start talking to my neighbors more about it. I need to start talking to to, the people at my son's school more about it. But the love of Jesus, his plan for their life, and their need to surrender and believe in him to take this message. So how do we see ourselves? I'll tell you what, that 99% of the time, if you feel unhappy and unfulfilled as a Christian... It's because you drop the ball and you're not living out the call he's called on your life. The people who see issues and complain about stuff and and all of that, I know when I got to that point in my life, if I was complaining about something, chances are probably my hands weren't busy doing the kingdom work. If I started worrying and complaining about things that just didn't matter, that didn't make a difference for eternity, my hands weren't busy doing what God's called me to do. Watered down message loses authority and becomes our words instead of, instead of God's. So we need to see the world different. We need to see ourselves different. This is one that hits close to home. We need to see our children different. There's a lot of things I can control in this world and there's some things I can't. Four children is one of them. I try my best, but there's a lot of things I can't control. How do we see our children? See, our children will be the exact byproduct of how we see this world and treat this world and how we engage with this world and how we see ourselves. I don't care what my kids are good at or not good at. I don't care any of that. I want them, if they model anything in my life is to, and, and surpass anything in my life, is to see this world as needing Jesus and then being called to bring it. Our children will be the exact byproducts. If your children see you afraid of the world, guess what? They're going to fear it too. They'll see it as something to be feared. If we don't engage in the world with compassion and authority and represent our king, our children will not represent our king. When we don't walk in the authority of Christ, they won't walk in the authority of Christ. I tell you what, if you try to shelter your kid and protect them from this world, you're just prolonging the inevitable. They need to see you stand with the authority of Christ. Let them see you preparing in your home. Let them see you preparing in your home, praying and reading. And I'm not talking about saying the three line, now I lay me down to sleep prayer at night. Let them see you pouring out your heart for the lost. Let them see you do more than sing about songs on Sunday. Let them see you live out that truth on Monday to Saturday. Let them see it. Let them see you weeping for people, for your lost family members. Let them see you carrying this message. Let them see you seeing the world as lost sheep that need Jesus and us as messengers from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I want to ask you guys this. Do we see the next generation, our children, do we see them as a target or do we see them as an arrow? I want you to think about this. Do we see them as a target or do we see them as an arrow? Do we see them as something that's going to get impacted by the world or do we see them as impacting the world? Do we see them with a big target painted on their back that they're vulnerable and the enemy is going to take them out so I better keep them safe? Or do we see them as something that the enemy should shake in his boots after? Do we see them as something that the enemy should be afraid of? The greatest weapons I have against the enemy are my four boys that I will prepare to meet this world head on. They will not be targets. They will not be victims. They will walk in the authority of Christ and they will be arrows for the kingdom of God. They will make an impact in this world. And that's all I care about. Psalms 127 verses 3 to 5 says, Children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. Children born to a young man or semi-young man are like the arrows in the hands of a warrior. How joyful is a man whose quiver is full of them. He will not be put to shame when he confronts his accusers at the city gates. We don't need to be afraid to lose them. The enemy needs to be afraid to engage them. My children are arrows, not targets. 
I'm going to invite the worship team back. You know, I pray that they see a glimpse of God in me and they take it and they run with it. That they see me occasionally messing up but willing to get back up, willing to turn around, willing to adjust, willing to, to, to see this world the way God sees it. All we really have to make a lasting impact on this world is our lives, which are short-lived, before we know what it's gone and what we're passing on to our kids and the investments we make in others. How do we engage a culture that's turned against us? It's a messed up world. There's so much pain, so much suffering, so much opposition. We love it. We love it with the love of Christ. We direct it to the cross. We walk through the muck and the filth with people from this world. We get our boots and our hands dirty. We take off the nice Sunday clothes and we live it out in real life. That's what we do. That's how we do it. That's how we engage a culture that's turned against us. I, I've, I've sat through seminars this week about about pastors making an impact and a difference and, and hearing testimonies and all this stuff. And it all started churches of 15 turning to, to 400. And communities that aren't not big metropolitan communities, communities of 3,000 people. And, and community, there's a story they, they shared of one lady who's in a community of, what was it, 1,000 people and she has like 100 people coming to her church. She showed up on the scene and she started engaging the culture. She wasn't afraid to step out. She's seen it as people who were lost. She's seen herself as a messenger. And she so far won 10% of her community to Jesus. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what we're supposed to do. Do we have opportunities? I'll tell you what, at a clothing exchange yesterday when 30 people showed up to, get, to swap out some clothing, because let me tell you, clothing kids is expensive. Unless your mother-in-law is Betty Schatz, who buys most of the stuff, and, and, and uh, Christina Kurtz, who does all the diapers and changing and does all that stuff. It's expensive. So what we do is we see a need. And we offer something to somebody, and when they come in, we're ready and prepared to share the gospel message with them. Why? Because they're lost, and they need it. Why? Because God's called us to bring this message to them. And why do we do it? Because we love Jesus, we want to obey him. And you know what? I want to see my kids do that too. So how we see ourselves, how we see our world, and how we see our children changes everything. We're called to be elements of change, catalysts for change. And we're called to raise messengers as well. I know it's scary. I know it's scary. It's scary for me to step out. I spend most of my time surrounded by Christians. It's scary to share the gospel message with people. But it's so rewarding. It's so amazing when you see a heart change and somebody come to Christ. We have opportunities at this church all the time to make an impact in our community, to share the gospel message. We try to set that up. I mean, you guys have your own lives, your own neighborhoods, your own jobs, your own friends and family. But we even try to set that up for you to have an easy way to share the gospel message. And we need to get on board and do this. I feel convicted. I spend way too much time in this office. I spend way too much time on stuff that doesn't matter for eternity. I spend way too much time holding hands with Christians, walking them through stuff that they've been through 50 times and should know better. We need to get out. We need to do this. We need to engage our culture. Because you know what? God's judgment does come. We can't miss that, that God's judgment does fall upon people. God's judgment does fall on culture that is turned against it. You know, we live in a great country. God's judgment's gonna fall on this someday. We're all gonna stand before God someday and have account. And we need to do what we can. We need to do what we can. We need to see ourselves as the messengers. 
Our children as the future. The world is lost and needing a savior and God calling us to and everything else doesn't really matter a whole lot. God first, God second, and God third. I believe that when we put God first, God second, and God third, that's what we have no other option but to do, to follow what he says. Let's stand together this morning. Heavenly Father, I pray that you challenge our hearts. God, challenge me. Start right here, God, for the things that I need to change in my life to put you first, second, and third. Challenge me, God, to, to engage with my culture, to engage with the world around me, not to be afraid, but to walk out in holy boldness with your message. God, help me fight the temptation to water it down, to change it, to make people around me receive it, God, but just to speak out with what you've called us to say. May it start in me, God. May it start in each of our hearts here today. God, we need to build it all on you. God, put you first, second, and third. We need you, Jesus. Help this hurting world. Send us out in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.